Today, uh, great to see so many people here. We're here to uh, uh, launch a study that uh, Deloitte have done, commissioned, uh, Deloitte Access Economics have done, commissioned by Fortescue. Uh, the order of uh, proceedings today is that you'll hear first from Chris Richardson, uh, partner at Deloitte Access Economics. Uh, Chris is going to explain the findings of the report, uh, and then we'll hear from uh, Nev Power, the CEO of Fortescue Metals Group. Uh, Nev will explain why Fortescue's taken a deep interest uh, in this particular topic. Uh, and then we'll have a Q&A session with a roving mic, so you'll be able to uh, uh, give these guys an absolute grilling uh, and um, uh, have a, hopefully a fun and robust exchange uh, towards the end of the event to, uh, to add some value for you. Uh, so without any further from me, can I introduce Chris Richardson. Chris is one of Australia's best known economists. Uh, he's a regular commentator for those of you who are uh, uh, Sky TV junkies. You'll probably see his uh, visage uh, quite a lot. Uh, he's a regular commentator on uh, macro uh, forecasting policy. He's the author of Business Outlook. Um, he's, the le he's a leader in his field of macro forecasting uh, and uh, has been uh, very busy recently talking about the federal budget. Uh, so Chris is uh, the, uh, the lead partner at Deloitte Access Economics and uh, we're delighted to welcome Chris today to share his work. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks Tim. Thanks everyone for coming along. I wanted just to start with some general thoughts for you. Uh, if I could. Um, first and most obviously, the rise of emerging Asia is rewriting the rule book around Australia's potential and its challenges. Uh, and it's been stunning, it's been stunning for Australia, and it's been really stunning uh, for Western Australia. And if you wanted to imagine the perfect complement to the rise of emerging Asia, you would conjure up a Western Australia. Um, the potential really is stunning. Now, the potential is changing, and, and a lot of the new opportunities, so we've just at Deloitte done um, a lot of work around thinking about uh, where Australia's economic potential heads in the next 10 or 20 years. And the absolute standout uh, for us, actually lay in gas. And one of the key reasons for that, um, so I, I spent some of my career in Washington DC at the, uh, the same time the then Speaker of the US House of Representatives was a guy by the name of Tip O'Neill. And uh, he said, and I've always liked, uh, he said, all politics is local. And the rise of emerging Asia has been a smokestack story. And if you look at the great cities, you know, everywhere from Beijing to Manila, every single politician is now focused on air quality. And, and you know, other things are, are happening. There's technological change in gas markets, and, and, you know, so there's supply side as well as demand side, but it's going to happen. Right? Gas is absolutely uh, going to be the way of the future for many people uh, in the next little while. Stunning opportunities uh, for the world, for Australia, for Western Australia. Um, challenges too, and you know we all know the cost and uh, and other challenges. But there are also challenges as markets link up. You know, as, as Australia develops uh, on the gas front uh, and starts to sell into those world markets, then we are increasingly, especially because of the policies we've adopted, linking those markets, which means linking those prices. And there are a bunch of gas users who are now starting to see risks around supply and prices. And it is actually both. And it's also a West Australian story, you know, although people are most exercised about this uh, over on the East Coast. It's a West Australian story too. And I want to take you to a thought today because economics is a toolbox. And, and the toolbox, you know, so people have reached into that and they say, well look, you know, as we're linking up these markets, you know, what's going to happen with, with domestic markets? And, and people have been grabbing reservation as a policy. Uh, and 
we don't really see that as a solution. If anything, we see it as a problem. I want you to open your minds today to a different thought. You can reach into the economics toolbox and do something different that we think is a lot more sensible, essentially, for everyone involved. If I stand back uh, and note a range of issues now developing uh, in the gas market, a lot of them, as I say, are, you know, everybody's focused on winners and, 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 and losers and the rest of it. But it is both supply as well as price. Um, if you are seeing what is potentially happening in markets uh, down the track, you are going to be looking at this. If Northwest Shelf chooses uh, not to continue to supply domestic markets, you get that dip down, see the, um, uh, the dark blue line, you get that dip down uh, some years from now. And it is some years from now, you know, the problems start to be evident about 2018 and continue uh, thereafter. Um, and you might think, well surely we've got a lot of time. The answer, and particularly in Western Australia, where commercial decisions involve really big dollars and really big lead times, we really need to start talking about better solutions now. These are costs, or potential costs, give what may well happen on the supply side. And again, if you look at the dark blue line, um, that essentially says supply to WA domestic markets um, in the not too distant future uh, becoming tighter than they are today. Um, equally, if you remember, there's a bunch of people out there um, currently using diesel. You look at the potential around demand, because it does make more sense uh, to use gas uh, rather than diesel uh, around the energy efficiency and, and cost effectiveness uh, of these. And that timing, uh, you know, the, again, given the long leads around these commercial decisions, this is a heartbeat away. And ordinarily, if you looked at a market where uh, other things equal, supply was likely to tighten, um, demand was likely to grow, you would think, well, surely this is a market where people are going to be really interested to do stuff, all right? You know, these are the classic uh, economics as an iron triangle around um, demand and supply and price, and you think, well, you know, surely there is marvellous uh, potential here. Um, and yet, everybody's seeing the problems. Uh, the problems that we think there are actually some solutions to. Um, if we're going to avoid a situation where some people would, in fact, uh, willingly pay the price, but it can't even get the supply, or many users are facing an increase in the price that they'll have to pay, what can we do about it? The answer comes down to, essentially, two things that are themselves connected. One is delinking the two markets. It is not necessarily the case that prices have to be essentially the same once you allow for net back, uh, you know, transport and other costs. We don't actually, economics does not say you have to have the same price in every market. It depends and it is important that the characteristics of the markets that we are talking about here are really quite different. Um, if you can delink those markets, if you can break the policy which is actually currently linking them, and related to that, you can free up the supply side here. There is the potential for win-win. Again, economics is a toolbox. Now, at the moment, the politicians and others have you know, reached in and, and grabbed reservation, you know, let's do this. But a toolbox contains a bunch of different tools. And I would suggest to you um, that it's not all about reservation and, you like that one? <laughs> the, uh, it's all about how we do this, all right? At the moment, you've got three big players there getting caught up in reservation uh, issues. One of whom, of course, has been um, uh, part of the story uh, for a very long time. Um, and when you have the big players whose focus is world markets, 
necessarily tied into domestic markets as well um, as a result of um, uh, those reservation policies. You are necessarily linking the opportunity cost. You know, those guys, if they, if they have to supply domestic markets, well, they're going to do it at commercial prices and what are commercial for them? Answer, it's the opportunity cost of um, you know, the next best thing, which is uh, world markets and maybe saving some transport and, and other related costs. We are necessarily linking two markets uh, with quite different characteristics. How are those characteristics different? It costs a fortune, well, the capital spending, to get properly to world markets. Now, a lot of what Australia and Western Australia has fits that. You know, a lot of what we have is perfect for that, and that is great. Right? The, the LNG is, a, is an Australian star of the moment and an Australian star of the future, uh, and so it should be. But because we've reached into the toolbox and grabbed a policy that necessarily connects up domestic markets to world markets, we've created a problem for ourselves. It's not necessarily the case. Right? There are already... Um, projects out there that are happy suppliers of domestic markets, given that, you know, other things equal, it costs some uh, suppliers less to reach domestic markets than to uh, world markets. There's the potential, and we already know it, right? it's already there. Um, these are, you know, we, we know about the existence of these sorts of things. But there is a lot of potential otherwise sitting around in retention places. At any given time, you know, a bunch of players in these markets are going to be um, developing something, but also sitting on things that, uh, where they see potential. You look at the timelines there. Some of the, you, know, sort of, um, you can see a whole bunch of them are uh, in that relatively short, you know, that sort of five year window. But there are a bunch of them over time uh, that have shifted into a retention phase. Uh, there is a conversation with governments and a case gets made uh, around these sorts of things and government says, all right, you guys can hang on to those. Um, now that's all well and good, but it is also the point at which we have the potential to properly delink these markets. What if some of that potential supply sitting out there would actually fit happily into you know, those set of conditions where, um, yes, you know, it would cost them a fortune to connect up to world markets. Um, that's not a commercial decision. Um, but if those were developed, maybe they would be happy suppliers to domestic markets. And that's a pretty important question. You know. Western Australia has a lot of potential supply locked up in these uh, retention leases. Now again, you know, many of them are not going to be commercial for anything uh, in the short term. But many of them may actually be. And that's exactly uh, a question that we look at. Um, because we have a problem. Right? If we're going to insist on reservation as an answer, we necessarily have the same price, again, net of, net back, um, of you know, relevant costs that you don't incur if you're going to domestic markets rather than world markets. If we insist that these massive players have to supply domestically, then they are going to do it at commercial rates. These prices have to be the same if you reach for that policy solution. But you can actually delink. Remember what world markets, what others do uh, around um, leases that uh, have been around for a while and, and lie fallow. They let them go back to the market. The commercial experience in Europe and elsewhere uh, is that as many of those otherwise retained leases head back to the market, um, other players do grab them and run with them. Um, this is something that Western Australia is familiar with. It's not just a story in gas. In other markets, you know, the, the, the things that got left behind, the people, you know, the leases uh, that people were otherwise sitting on, got grabbed, became commercial, and were a stunning success story. Right? That's true, for example, in iron ore. You're dealing conceptually with much the same issue. 
there is potential supply there that's not being commercially tested. If you do nothing, basically, if you leave those leases all tied up uh, and, and away from the, the spotlight, if you like, of transparency and, and commercial consideration by a range of players, you get what you get. Right? You get the problems that we all know. You get these arguments around the winners and losers of the reservation markets and the rest of it and, and what will the price be. And indeed, will there be a price at all that some players can even get gas domestically? Right? This is not just a problem, it is dumb. If you do better, if you shake up the supply side, um, um, you have the potential for more. So we looked at, or in combination with uh, an engineering firm, we looked at uh, a range of known and you know, publicly available information uh, around some suppliers and uh, the potential in others. We've simply named them Project A and Project B. Even with really quite conservative assumptions, there is the potential for um, a cost of supply, and, and, and you know, this allows for a 12% uh, uh, return, internal rate of return, and again, we've been conservative about loading up a bunch of things to even get these. Uh, and of course, economics being what it is, the, the, the price in markets above the, uh, the return is going to be the highest, the marginal one. At $7.2, however, you are substantially cheaper than, right? Economics, again, that, that iron triangle between demand and supply and price. If we free up supply, you're going to have an impact on price. And if you free up price, then you get other things equal. You know, three things. You get construction occurring earlier than uh, it would otherwise happen. You get an improvement in the cost competitiveness of users of, of energy uh, in Western Australia. And that cost competitiveness is a benefit that flows through to, um, uh, to the size of the economy and uh, to the employment base. And of course, you are becoming more energy efficient. Right? The, the, um, the construction comes earlier, uh, the cost competitiveness is important, and the energy efficiency is important. Uh, and indeed, those big dollars and they are substantially big dollars even in an economy like Western Australia where um, the dollar buckets have grown substantially over time. This is not something we should be ignoring. Um, and of course, if the supply side, you know, if we shake up those retention leases and the supply side news is even better than the fairly conservative assumptions we've allowed, then prices are lower still uh, and the impact on uh, employment and the size of the economy uh, is larger still. Let me summarise that for you. Reservation, or, you know, so, so you've come into the room and, and you know there are challenges, right? And, and the only kind of obvious thing on the table here is reservation and that massive, you know, um, struggle over winners and losers there. Just take a moment, you know, check that thought at the door and remember economics as a toolbox. What if there were a better way to do this? And that's the conversation that we think should be had. If you have reservation, you tie the prices together of two markets with really quite different characteristics. In one, it costs a fortune in capex to get to markets. In other, it's still pretty expensive, but it's not as expensive. And that says there's potential in a supply curve to do something. But we're not getting much there, or as much as we could, because we've got all this locked up stuff, and it's locked up under um, <coughs> processes that aren't as transparent as they could be. You shine a little commercial light on that, and we, you know, essentially everybody in the room has the potential for better outcomes. Reservation is not the solution. Uh, reservation is a problem. We think there's a better way to do it. It frees up supply at uh, lowest price. That has a range of benefits uh, for Western Australia, indeed for Australia, uh, and for uh, people in the room. Um, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Chris. That was uh, very, very informative. Um, I'd like to introduce now Nev Power very quickly, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Nev is the Chief Executive Officer of Fortescue Metals Group. Uh, he's in his uh, third year in that role, and uh, Nev has presided over the tripling of uh, production capacity at Fortescue, uh, which has been an enormous task. It's been one of the fastest, it's been the fastest ramp up 
uh, in the iron ore industry uh, globally. Uh, and in addition to that, at the same time, uh, in terms of advancing a, a social responsibility agenda, uh, NEVS uh, delivered a program called Billion Opportunities, uh, which has uh, provided now some award of some $1.5 billion of contracts and opportunities in our business uh, for our Aboriginal uh, business partners and joint ventures. Uh, so uh, without any further from me, I'd like to call Nev up to present. Thanks, Nev. Well, thanks very much, Tim, and thanks everyone for the opportunity to talk with you here today. And thank you, Chris, for that uh, fantastic presentation. I think um, Chris has that unique skill to be able to deep dive into economics, but still explain it so that the rest of us can understand. So we really appreciate that, Chris. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you might be sitting there saying, why is Fortescue suddenly interested in natural gas? Well, the fact is we are, we are a major energy user. And with our current energy consumption at 155 million tonnes per annum, would equate to somewhere between 8 to 10 per cent of Western Australia's domestic gas market. That's if we were able to convert completely into gas. We also see that Western Australia has a phenomenal advantage with natural gas and energy. And yet, we go to the trouble of taking oil-based energy that has been produced in the Middle East, refined through Asia, and transported all the way down to our mines in the central Pilbara, when just off the coast of Western Australia and throughout some of the uh, land-based sections of Western Australia, we've got phenomenal, <laughs> phenomenal uh, <laughs> reserves of natural gas. So what's standing between us and uh, converting to more and more natural gas is that we need certainty of long-term supply. We're not looking for subsidies, we're not looking for a hand up, we're just looking for the market to determine when gas reserves are developed, rather than that being locked up or held up through government processes. A little bit about Fortescue to start with. We are a very young company. Our first production occurred in 2008. So our oldest mine is just six years old and our youngest mine is less than six months old. We have shipped already to date. It's hard to do this because the slides go out of date the day you print them. But we've now shipped over 360 million tonnes to our customers throughout Asia. And we're running at a run rate of 155 million tonnes per annum at the moment. As well as that, we have a large and, and rapidly growing resource base here in the Pilbara. We have now around 12 billion tonnes of hematite resource and more than 5 billion tonnes of magnetite resource. So there is tremendous future potential for us to continue to develop. Over the last 12 months or so, we've made major impacts into the structure of our business. Last year, in 2013, we shipped 100 million tonnes and today we're running at 155, so it gives you an idea of the speed of that ramp up. We've already paid back over $3 billion of the debt we used to fund that expansion and we have started to focus on our costs and during the last 12 months, we've reduced our C1 cost, that's the cash cost to put our product on a ship, by uh, around 30%. But we have been very focused on our production ramp up, about building our mines and our infrastructure assets, and then bringing those into production and ramping them up quickly. It's now time for us to turn our focus to costs. Because while we've made some great inroads into our costs, it is only our costs and position on the cost curve globally that determine our long-term economic success. So if you look at our global position, you see that we are now third place behind the other two big Pilbara producers when it comes to our cost delivered into China, the most important market for us here in Western Australia. Interesting to see that we have now overtaken Vale in terms of delivered cost, particularly today when the, the CFRAT rates are still relatively low 
and we face a relative competitive advantage against barley um, as the sea freight rates increase. But this is a very dynamic picture and nobody else is standing still. Barley itself has just recently, over the last half, moved substantially down that cost curve. So this is not a matter of achieving a position on the cost curve and standing still. You have to keep running, you have to keep improving your position and bringing the costs further and further down. Coming to our energy spend, we spend around $800 million a year on energy. And the vast majority of that is burnt through our mining trucks. So there are some parts of our uh, business which is easy to convert from diesel to gas. And you see there we have a small amount of it gas powered now. But there is a large part that requires significant investment, both in terms of distribution systems, in terms of endpoint terminals, and conversion of mobile equipment, and particularly mining trucks. And to make that kind of investment, we want to be sure that we've got long-term certainty of supply and a market-driven regime to determine price. For us, our strategies about reducing our energy costs, which represent roughly 15 to 16% of those C1 costs that I put up before, is about conversion, firstly, of our power stations to natural gas and then looking at the process of gradually replacing or converting all of our major mining fleet to natural gas. This, we believe, is the energy of the future for us here in Western Australia. We are, of course, also focused on renewable energy, and we're looking at how we can integrate both solar and wind en energy more into our energy needs. However, we don't see this as doing any more than um, I guess the periphery of our energy demand, but we do see natural gas as being the base load energy source. Just putting this in perspective from a geographic point of view, the existing pipeline down the west coast, we've now announced the Fortescue River gas pipeline, the stage one of that, which will connect our Solomon hub with the Kings and Firetail mines. Um, to the domestic gas system. Those two mines alone produce 60 million tonnes per annum of our 155 million tonnes, and we have substantial tenements and resources to the west of Solomon. In the future, oh, so, sorry, I should say we're not waiting for that pipeline to be constructed to start this process. In the next couple of months, we will start the process of trucking compressed natural gas into Solomon to convert the power station over to gas immediately. The power station at Solomon, 125 megawatt power station, was built as a gas-fired power station, but we've been running it temporarily on diesel while we get uh, our gas infrastructure put in place. So prior to the pipeline being commissioned, we will use trucked compressed natural gas to come in to convert that power station over and start that process of reducing our energy costs. With the pipeline into Solomon Hub, we can then use the same process to truck gas across to the Chichesters and up to our Ironbridge um, uh, development for the magnetite prior to us uh, extending the pipeline. But ultimately, we see a network of gas distribution pipelines through the Pilbara, which will allow for distribution of gas by pipeline, very low cost, very environmentally friendly, and then nodal power stations with local distribution so that the whole Pilbara could eventually be hooked up to a gas and electricity grid. So what are we looking for? We're, as I said before, we are not looking for subsidies or any distortions to the economics of this. We are simply saying that the use it or lose it policy should be enforced to provide a transparent process for the renewal of leases. And as Chris said, this has got some great analogies back to the iron ore business. If you think back to the days pre-Fortescue, the Pilbara was dominated in terms of the two major players that who held all of the tenements through the Pilbara. It was only the enforcement of a use it or lose it policy that allowed us to get a big enough footprint to start our business. 
And if it wasn't for that, ladies and gentlemen, the 155 million tonnes that we ship, the 10,000 jobs that we have here in Western Australia, the $2 billion in taxes and royalties that we pay, the $1.5 billion that Tim talked about in terms of Aboriginal contracts and the 1,000 Indigenous employees that we have across the business, all of that would have been lost to Australia because we haven't stopped or displaced anybody else from developing their iron ore business to the extent that they wanted to. So the tonnes that we supply would have been supplied by a different country and that would have been lost to the Western Australia and Australian economy. We see the potential to unlock um, about three to four dollars a gigajoule in terms of gas price. And to put this in context, if you look at the Henry Hub gas price today in the US at around $4.50 uh, per gigajoule, it is an enormous difference to what we see here in Western Australia. And if we look what's happening in the US, we see terminals that were built on the east coast of the US which were designed for the importation of natural gas, now being converted to export terminals. The difference that it has made in the US is that manufacturing is starting to gear up again. You can hear the hammers starting in the factories of America now because they've now got an energy cost and an energy supply long term which allows the confidence for business to once again reinvest in manufacturing, in petrochemical and in, uh, in uh, manufacturing businesses. For us to diversify as a state and continue to develop our state to its maximum potential, a core to that is having competitive energy um, costs and certainty of supply as we go forward. In addition, as Chris outlined in his paper, there's a, over 2,000 extra jobs that could be created through the prices that we forecast here, let alone what could happen with, it, with prices like Henry Hub, and another 2.5 billion in gross state product. So for us, this is all about ensuring that there is certainty of supply in the future. And what we want to generate that supply is market conditions to prevail. So if it's not economic for the larger uh, gas producers to develop these deposits and supply the domestic gas market. Let them focus on LNG and let the rest of the market determine when it's economic to develop domestic gas um, supply. When we have certainty of supply, we will see that gas being then competitively priced and we'll have a market determined price for domestic gas rather than the LNG net back, which is a complete waste of capital. Think about the capital that goes into the cryogenics of producing LNG in the first place, then having to transport it back on shore, and then um, regasifying that. So we've got capital to get to um, liquefy and capital to regasify, which is all wasted economically in that supply chain. We see the opportunity for direct domestic gas supply into the pipe works and networks in, in Western Australia, providing for a domestic gas price which reflects the supply demand balance in the state rather than the cost of production of LNG. Some of the spin off benefits are the reduction in our carbon footprint and, I guess, reliable energy options for us going forward, which allows us to continue to develop our business with certainty. Thank you.